Okay then, so let's take an overview of the flight control system, just to get a general picture. So first of all, we have the primary flight controls. They comprise of the ailerons, the rudder, the elevator, and the pitch trim system. The ailerons, rudder, and elevator, they're all hydraulically operated. The pitch trim system is electrically operated. The secondary flight controls consist of the flaps, the flight spoilers and the ground spoilers. The spoilers, flight and ground spoilers, they're both hydraulically operated and the flaps are electrically operated. Um, the wing design is classified as something called supercritical. What this means is that it, it, the wing provides excellent lift characteristics. However, the, this design means that the wing stalls very rapidly without warning once that envelope is reached. Um, so with a normal wing, so to speak, um, the crew would get an indication of the onset of a stall with some clues because you start to get some buffeting. You don't get that with this wing. It's everything is fine and then suddenly boom, the stall happens and it rips your eyeballs out. So we have a stall protection system, which is quite important, obviously, which will prevent that limit from being reached. So the stall protection system, we'll cover it a bit later on, comprises of um, a shaker and a stick push system that will, will, will stop him from reaching that envelope. The primary flight control systems, so elevator, ailerons, rudder, do not have manual reversion. They are designed to provide a fail-safe operation should any of the following malfunctions occur. So if there's a jam in the system or a disconnect, if the, you lose normal electrical power, if you lose any two of the three hydraulic systems, and we'll look at the hydraulic systems in the next section, or if there's a complete failure of one or both engines, but they do not have manual reversion. If you lose complete hydraulics, if you lose all three hydraulics, there will literally be no primary flight controls. So the hydraulic system is very important. We've got three systems. <clears throat> you can lose any two systems <clears throat> and everything still works, albeit in a sort of reduced capacity. And um, plus all these others, so loss of normal electrical power, failure of both engines, or if there's a jam or disconnect. The primary flight controls provide control and trim around the uh, three axes, pitch, roll and yaw. For, for the pitch axes, we provide uh, elevators, hydraulically operated. Pitch trim is obtained by moving the whole horizontal stabilizer. Control and trim around the roll axes are obtained by moving the ailerons, and they're hydraulically operated, and around the yaw axis by moving the rudder, obviously also hydraulically operated. There are no tabs of any kind on any of the control surfaces. To achieve trim, we offset the control surfaces out of their normal neutral position, apart from obviously the pitch trim where we move the horizontal stab. So on the secondary flight control side of things, these comprise of the flaps, the flight spoilers, and the ground spoilers. And, and these are referred to as lift modulation devices as their function is to change the lift or drag characteristics of the airfoil. The flaps obviously increase lift produced by the wing at low, low air speeds by changing the shape of the wing and increasing the area of the airfoil. The flight spoilers, when deployed, provide a means of dissipating excess energy by increasing drag, reducing lift, which enables high rates of dis descent to be attained. Flight spoilers are manually actuated in flight and are also used on the ground after landing or rejected takeoffs. Um, when it says manually act actuated, it means manually selected. They're, they're hydraulically actuated. The ground spoilers are automatically deployed on landing or rejected takeoffs to dump wing lift and increase drag. We also got a stall protection system that's considered part of the flight control system. We'll cover it a bit later on. And it provides visual, oral and tactile alert of an impending stall, including stick shakers and stick pushers. 
The stall protection system will actively prevent the aircraft from developing an unrecoverable stall angles of attack. So it prevents you getting into a stall. That's the whole idea. It doesn't let the aircraft stall and then trying to sort it out. It stops it from stalling in the first place. As we said earlier, this is a critical wing. Once you've stalled, it's game over pretty much. OK, let's have a look at the controls that the pilots use to operate these various systems. Some of them pretty conventional. So for the ailerons, we've got the hand wheels and elevators are controlled columns. So nothing uh, strange there. Rudder, same with the rudder. You operate the rudder through the rudder pedals. For aileron trim, and remember we reposition the neutral position of the ailerons, there's an aileron trim panel, a trim switch on the centre pedestal panel. And it's actually made up of two switches and you have to push them both at the same time. Um, the rudder trim, there's, a, there's a, a rotary kind of switch next door to that to operate the rudder trim. The pitch trim switches, not shown in the picture, but they're on there with switches on the control wheel. Flaps, you can see there we got our flap selector lever. The, you can also see the flight spoiler um, control lever. And for the ground spoilers, there's a switch on the center pedestal. It's not shown in this picture, but basically ground spoilers, there's an arming, disarming switch. Um, we'll look at it on another panel when we get to the cover the ground spoilers in more detail. But there is a, there's a switch to arm the uh, ground spoilers. With the exception of the flaps and the trim actuators, all the flight control surfaces are hydraulically operated through PCUs. These receive pilot input through a network of cables, pulleys and push-pull rods. The flaps are selected by a lever, providing an input signal to an electronic control unit, which controls the operation of two electrical motors. And the controls for the pitch, roll and your trim are provided from the pilot input switches that drive electrically driven actuators. Trimming of the aileron and rudder systems is done by using electrical actuators which displace the normal input linkage to the PCUs which cause that surface to be hydraulically repositioned. Pitch trim, that's done with an electrical screw jack actuator which changes the incidence of the horizontal stab which responds to inputs or output signals to, from the uh, electronic control unit. And for the primary flight controls, we've got three hydraulic systems. They're completely independent of each other, um, and each supplies pressure to the primary flight controls and the ground spoilers and flight spoilers. And we'll look at how that's distributed on the next slide. So this is how the hydraulic power is distributed using the three hydraulic systems to the, the flight control surfaces. I won't read through it all. I'll, I'll leave this page um, on screen for a few seconds just to let you digest it. But what I will mention is the elevators. So obviously we've got two elevators, two physical elevators, and each elevator has got two hydraulic actuators. Now the elevators, the left and right elevators, are there, although of course they work together normally, uh, but they're not mechanically joined together at the elevator section. So depend on the, your failure situations, potentially you may only have one elevator working. So the aircraft's not going to handle as good as it would normally in that situation. But it just depends on the failure situations that are going on with the hydraulic systems. Uh, as we said earlier, the system can still work. It's still controllable in three axes if you lose any two of the hydraulic systems. How it will be formed and what which surfaces are working and which are not working will depend on which two hydraulic systems you've lost. So there are separate control runs for the pilot and co-pilot flight controls, generally running down the left and right hand side of the cabin under the floor, um, as you can see from the picture there, which allows the um, controls to function in unison because they are interconnected uh, with a torch tube at the front end. The roll and pitch control systems can be individually disconnected by the roll and pitch disconnect handles if there's an event, if there's a jam in the mechanical system. So this allows the control of one aileron or one elevator 
if a, if a jam occurs on the opposite side. In the case of a rudder jam, there's a breakout mechanism provided which will allow the rudder to control to be maintained by the cables on the unjammed side. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail uh, when we get to it. We've got a um, synoptic page that we can bring up and we can view the status of the flight control system. We can see everything moving. Um, and plus also, of course, if there's any major issue, then we will alert the crew with warning, caution, or status, or advisory messages. On the synoptic page, we can see the primary and secondary control positions, and also the trim positions. So, aileron control is provided by two hydraulically operated ailerons at the rear of the wings between wing station 282 and 253. Pilot inputs to the ailerons are achieved through a cable and pulley system operated by two interconnected hand wheels mounted on the control columns. And the interconnection is here where the torque tube that can be split and in the center of it there's a roll disconnect mechanism. The two hand wheels are linked by a cable system with an interconnecting shaft and then the cables run down the left hand side and the right hand side of the cabin under the floor and then this area here is in the wheel well area. We've got a spring loaded artificial fill unit incorporated in the aft part of the controls uh, circuit where the rear quadrant is. Um, each aileron is moved hydraulically by individual PCUs and each PCU is a dual unit consisting of two equal and parallel power components with a common interconnected in input linkage. So each, so to summarize what that's saying is each aileron has got two actuators but, but the actuators are kind of a pack, joined together package. The outboard um, power components are connected to the number three system and the inboard ones are connected to system one on the left and two on the right. Aileron trim is achieved through an electrically driven actuator linked to the aft quadrant by a rod and bell crank system. And again, we'll look at that in more detail in a couple of slides. The aileron control wheels are the horn type hand wheels. They're mounted in a, um, on a shaft. It's got a spline on top of the control columns. And the shaft incorporates a cable quadrant with integral fixed maximum travel stops. The quadrant is connected with cables to the forward cable quadrant just below the cockpit floor. <clears throat> Each um, hand wheel's got a pitch trim switch, a pitch trim disconnect switch, an autopilot stick push disconnect switch, an autopilot flight uh, synchronization switch, and a microphone switch. The center part of the hand rule has got a chart holder with a built-in light. The forward cable quadrants are installed at the ends of a transversely mounted torque tube under the cockpit floor. And each quadrant gets, receives the cables from its hand wheel, transmits that movement to a second cable set connected to its respective aft quadrant. The roll disconnect mechanism um, is in the center of that transverse tube and is connecting the left hand side and the right hand sides together. So in the unlikely event of a jam condition in either the pilot side or the co-pilot side the two can be separated by pulling on a disconnect handle and turning it 90 degrees. We'll, we'll take a look at uh, that handle in a second and um, it will operate and disengage the two halves of the torque tube. When the two half shafts have been disconnected, the unjammed aileron will now be free to operate. The other side will remain jammed and it won't move. To reset it is quite easy. You just basically reset the handle, get the torque tube lined up and it, and it pings back in position. The aft quadrants are groove pulleys located in the main landing gear wheel well. One groove receives the input from the pilot, from the control wheel, coming in here where it says command input. 
<clears throat> and the other groove transmits this um, movement to its wing quadrant. Each quadrant also has an artificial fill unit, which is here, which is basically just a spring. <clears throat> so when the pilots move the control wheels, this pulley is going to rotate, and as it does so, it's going to ride up, it's going to cause this roller here to ride up on this cam, stretching the spring. And that provides our artificial fill. When the hand wheel is released, the spring tension will cause the roller to ride back down uh, the cam to its neutral position, which is where it is now, providing a centering force on the control circuit. The right aft quadrant has a third groove, which gets the input from the autopilot servo. So the cables from the aft quadrant, as the quadrant that's in the main landing gear wheel well, are routed along the ring, wing rear spar and they terminate at a quadrant just forward of where the aileron is. This quadrant, known as the uh, aileron cable tension regulator, incorporates springs which maintain a constant cable tension on the aileron cables to compensate for wing flexing and expansion contraction due to temperature cha changes. The Aileron PCU is a dual unit consisting of two identical double acting cylinder actuators with an interconnected input linkage. <clears throat> the actuators are mounted onto a common plate which attaches to the wing structure and the output pistons are connected to the Aileron via a couple of dog bone links. Although the PCU has a common input linkage, there's only one linkage in fact, one input linkage coming from that um, uh, cable tension regulator. <clears throat> they are separate units, they're not interconnected hydraulically, and either, either actuator of the PCU is able to carry the load should the other actua actuator fail, or if we lose one of those hydraulic systems. The main components of each actuator consists of a double-ended piston acting inside a hydraulic cylinder, a manifold assembly housing a dual concentric sleeve combination control and anti-jam valve, a relief valve, a filter, check valves, a fluid compensator and a failure monitoring device. The control valve, which is operated by the input linkage, will direct fluid from one side or the other of the actuator to make it extend or retract. A summing and feedback linkage is provided to null out the system when the aileron position is, is equal to the input command. Um, a control valve will recenter, uh, blocking hydraulic flow from both sides of the piston, which will maintain the aileron in that selected position. The PCU also contains an internal damping valve, which provides gust lock capabilities when the system's depressurized. And it's benched rig, the PCU is benched rig bench tested and you put it you install it without any adjustments needed each PCU control valve contains a failure sensing pressure switch which electrically signals a jam of the control valve to the DCUs this generates an aileron PCU caution message on the ICAS as well as an amber symbol on the flight control synoptic page to identify the faulty PCU. The serviceability of the four pressure switches is confirmed on aircraft power up once we've pressurized all three hydraulic systems and what you'll see is an aileron monitor OK advisory message appear on the ICAS page. There's a torsion bar anchored to the rib at station wing station 353 just outboard of the aileron and it interacts with a crank which is attached to the aileron via a link. There's a lip on the torsion bar that interacts with the crank in such a way that it counteracts the upward movement of the aileron with increasing force because you're twisting the torsion bar if you lift the ailerons up. The idea of this is to prevent the possibility of aileron um, upfloat 
if you lose total hydraulic pressure to the uh, PCU. Downward movement of the aileron is not affected by the torsion bar and uh, there's no additional resistance. Each aileron has got a uh, flutter damper. Now these are self-contained hydraulic dampers located just outboard of each uh, aileron PCU. It's mounted on the wing box structure and connected to the aileron front spar by a little idler lever and a breakaway link. And the idea of this installation is to provide flutter damping if you lose uh, hydraulic fluid from both actuators. It is completely standalone, it's not connected to the hydraulic system. You can see there's a little sight gauge on there um, for um, if you need to refill it, um, and a little sort of kind of pop out indicator. So we have some aileron position transmitters. <clears throat> if we look at the picture there, there are actually three transmitters altogether. There's one single uh, transmitter on the left aileron and one single transmitter on the right aileron. And on the right aileron, in addition to that, there's a dual transmitter. Okay, now the single transmitters feed their signal into the servo switching module, which is inside the IAPS. And from there, it gets routed to the DCU. And the DCU is using this information from the two single transmitters, one on each aileron, to go to generate the aileron position information on the um, synoptic page. The dual transmitter, which is only on the um, right hand aileron, they send their signals into the servo switching module but it doesn't end up in the DCU. It's then used by the flight control computers as part of the aileron flight or the autopilot control loop. <clears throat> Power supply for the transmitters is off the 26 volt AC essential bus. And uh, I can't remember if we mentioned about the A26 volt AC system. We know about the 115 volts AC for sure, um, but the, we use quite a lot of 26 volts AC for this type of thing for position sensors within the avionics system <clears throat> um, and what there is, there is to generate um, uh, this voltage, this 26 volts uh, AC voltage, is we have auto transformers attached to the main bus that it's attributed to. So for example, the 26 volt AC essential bus gets power from the 115 volts essential bus via a transformer and the 26 volts AC bus 2 gets gets the original power, the 115 volt power via a transformer from um, AC bus 2. So anon trim is applied by a, via push rods and bell cranks from the trim actuator, which is an electrical linear actuator, to the roller arm segment of the artificial fill unit, the, the one we looked at earlier on. Activation of the aileron trim will displace the roller arm, but the spring tension on the roller will keep it in the centered position, and it causes the whole quadrant to rotate. So rather than the roller riding up the cam like it does in an artificial field situation, it stays in the center of the cam, the roller, and it causes the whole quadrant to rotate. This makes an input into the aileron system. <clears throat> the pilot and co-pilot's hand wheels will move and the ailerons will be displaced out of their normal neutral position. The autopilot servo when it's operating causes a rotation of the co-pilot's aft quadrant which causes a left or and right aileron input. This input is transferred to the left side through the torque tube between the left and right forward cable quadrants. And what we do on the next slide is just go through the electrical side of this uh, diagram. So let's take a look at the electrical side of the trim system. So what we have is a power supply of DC Buzz 2 comes to the aileron trim switch. Here's the aileron trim switch here. And you'll see that the trim switch is made up of two segments and they have to push them both down for the trim system to work. It's spring loaded to the center, which is how it's drawn in the electrical diagram. And we've got right wing down and left wing down. So let's do a left wing down operation. So we push both segments of the switch to the left wing down. So those set of contacts there will close and those set of contacts of the, of the switch there will close. 
This allows power to be routed along through the switch contacts and it comes down to the trim actuator motor and it's looking for a ground signal to complete the circuit and the ground signal is coming through the retract limit micro switch which is inside the actuator and the ground signal is provided by the closed set of contacts on the second switch boom 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 so now the motor will operate and it keeps on going until either we release a switch or it reaches the fully retracted position obviously if you don't press both segments together it won't work because you won't, you'll either not have power or you'll not have a ground signal you'll so need to have both to go right wing down so this time we push the switch contacts to right wing down so those contacts there close those contacts there will close and this time power comes from the same source routed through this time the extend limit micro switch to the trim motor it's looking for a ground signal so the ground signal is going to be provided by um, the switch being in the the second contact of the switch being in the right wing down position boom 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 there's the ground signal there and the motor operates this time in the other direction and it will keep on running until we either let go of the switch or the extend it reaches a fully extended position and the extend limit micro switch will break and it stop which stops the motor from working trim position is calculated by a rvdt or an lvdt actually inside the actuator itself so this is what this is trying to illustrate here so we've got a position transducer that sends information off to the dcus for trim position indication so the aileron trim is indicated on the icas um, primary page down towards the bottom and it receives position signals from the trim actuator via the IAPS, IOC and the DCU in the way that we've said. So the, the trim position is calculated internally within the actuator. It's sent to the DCU, goes through the IAPS and it ends up on the ICAS primary page. The indications consist of a dual pointer superimposed on a round dial with calibrated markings. <clears throat> At the bottom of the dial, left wing down and right wing down denote the actuator positions of the left and right wing down, respectively. There's only a, a couple of ICAST messages, messages associated with the aileron uh, system or the roll control system. One is the aileron PCU caution message. Um, and plus, with that message, you'll get the little amber half moon shaped icon on the synoptic page of the aileron actuator that's picked up by that pressure switch the control valve um, monitoring switch within the PCU and then the aileron monitor OK advisory message uh, that happens uh, once you've powered up and you switch on all three hydraulic systems um, it does a built-in test and if everything's good you'll uh, get an aileron monitor OK uh, advisory message So elevator control is provided by a set of hydraulically operated elevators. As we said earlier, there's no mechanical interconnection between the two elevator surfaces. They're hinged at, to, at the back on the rear spar of the horizontal stab. We've got two control columns in the cockpit. They are joined together left and right sides with an interconnecting torque tube that got, that's got a uh, disconnect mechanism incorporated into it and this will allow the pilot to isolate the left and right side circuits should one of them become jammed in the elevator control circuit we've got two pitch fill simulator units that provides artificial fill to the control column for the required increase in control force as you go faster it's a little bit of an odd system because so although the idea is we increase force as we go faster it's actually not using air data as a reference to do that. It's using the position of the horizontal stab, which moves as you go faster. So um, it receives a mechanical input from the horizontal stab, which moves over a nine degree range proportional with airspeed to maintain the aircraft trim. And there's a spring tension inside the pitch field simulator it is increased or decreased in relation to the stab position to give us our increasing or decreasing pitch forces 
we'll look inside the Pitchfield simulator in a couple of slides and you'll see what's going on. Each elevator is driven by two PCUs on each one. System 3 operates the inboard PCUs on each elevator. And System 1 does the left outboard, System 2 does the right outboard PCU. And as we already know, pitch trim is achieved by varying the incidence of the horizontal stab with an electric trim actuator controlled by an electronic control unit. Starting from the cockpit then, the, the elevator system's got the following main assemblies. So obviously the control columns, then underneath the control columns on the torch tube, the pitch di disconnect mechanism. Then we have a forward cable quadrant, moving backwards to an aft cable quadrant. Then we have the pitch field simulators. Then something called a gain change mechanism. We'll talk about that a bit later. Some load limiters to prevent damage to the mechanical system due to excessive loading. And we've got some aft linkage balance springs, some jam tolerant input rods so that the PCUs can still work if there's a jam. The PCUs themselves, auxiliary centering mechanisms, flutter dampers, and the position transmitters and ICAS indications. Each control column is mounted on pivots in the cockpit floor, and, and at the top of the hand wheel, you've got um, the hand wheel with the aileron cables going through the column. <clears throat> you've got a stick st shaker assembly on each control column above the floor. Then below the floor, the column is connected to a push-pull rod that drives the forward cable quadrant. When, the column, when it's in neutral, the column is actually slanted four and a half degrees forward. Four and a half travel is limited by two stops at the lower end of the column. And the right-hand column also has a balance weight or balance spring, which compensates for the static weight of the columns when in, their, in the neutral position. So the um, pitch disconnect mechanism, very similar to the aileron system. You've got a transverse torque tube that cross couples the left and right sides together. And in the middle, there's a disconnect mechanism, which if there's a jam in the mechanical system, the crew can pull the disconnect handle and it splits that torque tube into two halves. One half will become free. The other half will remain jammed. And the half that's free, it will operate that side uh, aileron. To reset the system, you just reset the handle and then um, position the control column so they line up with each other and then the system just kind of clicks back in position. Looking at the pitch fill simulators now, we have two of them mounted on the uh, top of the vertical stab and they produce two types of fill. Um, the variable pitch fill and pitch control centering. And they enable higher pitch control effort with increasing airspeed and a lightening of control loads as airspeed increases. This force is varied according to horizontal stab position. Now, as the aircraft speed increases or decreases, the pitch trim, the horizontal stab trim changes, either by the pilot or automatically by the autopilot. And that will increase or decrease the forces on the elevator control system. So let's take a look at how this pitch trim, uh, pitch fill, sorry, system um, works. So we said it's the idea is we want to increase the force as we go far, go faster, and decrease the force as we go slower. <clears throat> but it's not using airspeed directly as a reference point. What it's doing is looking at the pitch, tr uh, pitch trim position as the reference point, on the basis that as the aircraft goes faster the pitch trim is changed either automatically by the autopilot. Um, if the autopilot's not engaged, it's changed by the mat trim function or the pilot will change it manually. Now this lever here is connected to the elevator input. So this lever here is gonna be moving up and down when we move the control column. And as it moves up and down, basically it's operating through this spring mechanism. This lever here, which is pivoting around this point, causing the, the, this roller here to ride up and down this cam, whether we're going up or down. 
this roller, as it rises up and down this cam, is flexing this leaf spring. Okay? So it doesn't matter which way we're going. As the roller rides up the cam, it's going to flex this leaf spring here. This is kind of like a leaf spring. It's going to go doing, 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 flexing like that. The amount of tension on this leaf spring is changed by the position of this roller here, which slides up and down that channel. And this lever here is changed by the position of the horizontal stab. It's connected to this lever here. So this end of this lever is connected to the horizontal stab position. <clears throat> so the horizontal stab moves, it moves this lever, which causes this roller here to slide up and down that channel. And as it slides up and down the channel, it increases or decreases the force on this leaf spring. As it slides down the channel, the, the force on the leaf spring increases. And when it's in this position here, it's like the least uh, resistance. And you've got least resistance on the, leaf, the least force on this uh, leaf spring. So that's basically how the pitch feel simulator is working. And there are two of these, one connected to the left and one connected to the right side. The game change mechanisms are located in the vertical stab to the rear of their respective aft cable quadru quadrants. And the idea of them is to decrease the control column sensitivity around the neutral position and increase it uh, as you go away from the neutral position. And this allows the aircraft to be hand flown without excessive pitch sensitivity when they're in the sort of cruise straight and level flight. When a large pitch input is commanded, the gain change allows the full linear travel of the input to equal the output, enabling full control response. <clears throat> I've put on a graph here to try and illustrate that, but don't take the figures and the slope of the graph as gospel, because I made the figures up in Excel just to illustrate what I was trying to say. But you can see here for every degree of movement of the control column, around the neutral position, you get a very small amount of elevator displacement. But as you move away from the neutral position, the for every degree of movement of the control column, you get a progressively increasing uh, elevator response. The load limiter is a spring control rod with a spring loaded um, rod end. It's installed between the gain change mechanism and the PCU's input mechanism. And its purpose is to protect the input mechanism from excessive loads should the controls be operated without hydraulic pressure. The upper end of the load limiter is attached to a bell crank mounted on top of the vertical stab. Attached to the bell crank is an adjustable balance spring, which should the load limiter or downstream control rod become detached, prevents their static weight from initiating un unwanted command inputs to the PCUs. The jam tolerant PC input rods are located between the input torque tube and the PCU input linkage. They will expand or collapse against internal spring tension if both P PCUs on one side have got no hydraulic pressure, enabling operation of the opposite side elevator. If a PCU control valve jams, the jam tolerant rod will allow the operation of the adjacent PCU. The PCUs then, um, on each elevator, we've got two identical PCUs. The control valve moves in response to pilot input to port hydraulic fluid to one side or the other of the piston, which extends the actuator up or down. As the piston moves, a feedback lever attached to the end of the piston will null out the pilot input once the desired piston displacement is achieved. The PCU control valve is internally spring-loaded to return to the extended nose-up position should the control input linkage become disconnected. The PCU becomes fully adjusted and bench tested. No adjustments are needed or indeed are possible on an installed PCU with the exception of removal or installation 
of a small inlet filter. Auxiliary centering mechanisms are mounted under the upper skin of the horizontal stab and they work in conjunction with springs integral to the that control valve of the PCU mentioned above to return the PCU to neutral in case of a disconnected input rod. They are loaded to move the control valve to a retracted or nose down position. When the elevator reaches a neutral position, the two springs are in equilibrium and will maintain the control valve in that null position. Each elevator is protected against aerodynamic, aerodynamic flutter by two flutter damper assemblies. Uh, each damper is a self-contained double acting hydraulic actuator or damper uh, containing a balance piston between two fluid filled damping chambers. The damper piston rods connect to fittings which bracket the elevator center hinge at the stabilizer at station 62, uh, 62.04. Um, these dampers actually they are exactly the same as the aileron flutter dampers. So the position and movement of the elevator um, is indicated on the flight control synoptics page and the ICAS display receives a signal from each of the elevator position transmitter synchro via the IOPS and DCU and we can see from the little schematic here what's going on so again we're using 26 volts AC as the power supply from uh, the essential bus for the left hand side DC bus uh, AC bus 2 from the right hand side uh, but we've only got two synchros remember on the aileron system we had um, three in fact one on each and then on the right hand one we had a, a dual one as well uh, that was used for the flight control computers well in the elevator system we've only got two one on each surface and it's used for the flight control computers and the synoptic page so they're sharing all the data so the transmitters though are identical to those on the ailerons apart from the dual one they cause their left or right elevator pointer on the on the display to move to the, on the vertical scale marked elevator fourth scale deflation response it corresponds to 23.6 degrees up 18.4 degrees down the elevator position pointers will appear when the flight control synoptic page is selected and of course the position signal is valid There's only, there's only one ICAST message directly related to the elevator system, and that's the caution message elevator split. And this will come on if the left or right elevator position is split or um, asymmetric, shall we say, by more than five degrees. Remember, the two elevators are physically not connected together. They can operate independently, although obviously in, in reality, they're always going to be working together and they should be working in unison with each other. And, and we will get a warning if we've got an elevator split of more than five degrees. If you've got a control jam and you've pulled the disconnect, undoubtedly you will see this message. Moving on to the pitch trim system then, which as we've already mentioned is accompanied by a varying the angle of incidence of the horizontal stabilizer. The system moves the leading edge of the horizontal step between zero and minus nine degrees, the leading edge down, controlled at defined rates of movement. Pitch trim is operated in three modes, manual trim, autopilot trim, and MAC trim. A horizontal stab trim control unit, an HSTCU, receives the manual and automatic inputs and controls the rate so um, of movement so the HSTCU is in charge of the whole system the other component we've got is something called the motor control unit which provides the muscle or power to drive the motor in one direction or the other so the HSTCU signals a motor control unit which controls the uh, trim actuator which positions the horizontal stab the stab movement is transmitted via push rods to the pitch field simulators of the elevator system, as we know how that works, to vary the amount of stick force required in relation to stab angle. The main components in the system, we've got the horizontal stab, contrim, uh, stab contrim 
stab trim control unit which is in the avionics compartment we've got the motor control unit which is um, adjacent to the trim actuator we've got the horizontal trim actuator itself up up on the top of the vertical stab we've got the stab trim control panel where we can isolate the two channels of the HSTCU we can disable the MAC trim switch uh, function We've got two sets of manual trip control, manual trim control switches, one on each control column, two trim disconnect switches on the control column, one on each one, and then there's the ICAS interface so we can see the position of the trim. The um, HSTCU interfaces with the following systems. Uh, obviously the ICAS, so we can see our trim indication and um, pick up any uh, faults. The autopilot uh, for pitch trim rate speed control when the autopilot's engaged. For with the air data computers, which is picking up airspeed input when the autopilot's disengaged and MAC trim function is operative. The PSEU, which disables the ground maintenance bit when we're in the air, and the maintenance diagnostics computer, um, so we can display all our faults and binary codes and stuff on the MFD or uh, MFD one or two when we enter the air MDC. The motor control unit is an electronic control unit that controls the speed and direction of the motors uh, attached to the horizontal trim actuator and it's mounted right next to the horizontal trim actuator and it receives these signals from the um, HSTCU which is the brains behind it all. We get 115 volts power from AC bus 2 for channel 1 and AC, bu AC essential bus for channel 2 and the motor control unit processes this power through a four-way rectifier because actually the motors are DC motors. It uses 270 volts DC, but although that's variable for the speed. So it produces a variable DC power output to drive the motor um, at, at, a, at a certain speed in a certain direction as commanded by the HSTCU. In addition, the control unit, the motor control unit receives DC power from the HSTCU, which is used by the horizontal actuate, trim actuator to operate the actuator control circuits and the four motor brake solenoids. The MCU provides current limitation and overheat protection for the two motors. And it also provides feedback signals to the HSTCU of actuator position, motor speed and direction, as well as any detected failure conditions. And we can see there that it's attached to the vertical stab structure just immediately forward of the HSTA. The HSTA is an electromechanical unit and it positions the actuator or the stab surface in response to signals from the motor control unit. The trim actuator contains the following. So in there we've got two electric motor assemblies, a screw jack and a gearbox module, four position sensors, two per channel, two speed sensors, one per channel. There are two motor assemblies onto the, attached to the actuator and each one includes a motor, sensors and a brake. Two solenoids control the operation of each brake and each solenoid is supplied with 28 volts from the HSTCU via the motor control unit to release the brakes. The screw jack contains a screw jack and then a primary or driven nut and a secondary nut. And because of the pitch and diameter of the thread, it cannot be back driven once a load is applied to it. The screw jack is connected to a gearbox module, which is driven by either of the two HSTA motors via a torque limiter. The torque limiter is a multi-disc spring loaded device, which protects a horizontal stab actuating system from overloading. Two motors share a common drive, so the inactive motor channel is turning unpowered when the motor operates, when the active motor operates. So remember we have two channels, but only one channel is kind of doing the work. 
So, so this is the reason why we have two solenoids per motor brake, because we have to release the brakes on both motors, even though we're only going to use one motor. We've got to release the uh, brake on both motors to allow the other motor, the inactive motor, to be able to rotate. Um, so the HSTA contains four position sensors, two on each channel, and each sensor contains an RVDT, um, which is operated from the screw jack through the gear assembly. The sensors supply a scaled DC signal to the MCU, which is then passed on to the HSTCU. Uh, there are two speed sensors in the actuator, one for each motor assembly. The sensor is an alternator mounted on the motor shaft, and they send the supply signals to the MCU, and the MCU will then forward that information onto the HSTCU. In the cockpit, on the center pedestal panel, we've got our st st uh, stab trim control switches marked channel one, channel two. And the function of these two switches is to initialize the control channels of the HSTCU as follows. And normally you would select them both on or engage them both. And when they're both engaged, by default, channel one is in command and channel two is in standby mode. So this is a normal flight condition. You can disable these switches by pushing a single one. So if you push channel one, it will then hand over control to channel two, <clears throat> but, but with no standby and vice versa. Next door to the two channel switches, we've got a MAC trim engage disengage switch, which contains an amber in op light when it's disabled or disengaged. <clears throat> when the switch is pushed in, the MAC trim function of the HSTU is set and the in-op light will illuminate, uh, it will extinguish. When it is pushed again, the MAC trim function of the HSTCU is disengaged and the in-op in light will illuminate, accompanied by a MAC trim caution message on the ICAST primary page. Now the MAC trim function <coughs> normally works when you're manually flying or hand flying the airplane with the autopilot disengaged. And as long as you've got the MAC trim engaged, with the autopilot disengaged, the MAC trim function will work. And it kind of, um, it will automatically trim the aircraft in relation to max speed, because as we go faster, you get a MAC tuck phenomenon, um, and the nose tends to kind of pitch down, and the MAC trim function automatically compensates for that, automatically. When the autopilot's engaged, the autopilot's automatically doing everything anyway. But when the autopilot's disengaged, to take some load off the pilot, the MAC trim function kicks in, as long as you've got the MAC trim engaged. On the pilot and co-pilot's hand wheels, we've got our um, manual trim switches. They are dual segmented switches. You've got to push the both segments in together at the same time for the system to work. And when these are operated, they control the direction of the horizontal stab movement via the HSTCU. Also on each pilot's co-pilot's hand wheel, there's a pitch trim disengage switch or disconnect switch, which will disconnect the pitch trim system completely and disable it. <clears throat> so they would do that if they've got some sort of pitch trim run runaway or something like that. Once it's been disengaged from the disconnect switch, the system will need to be re-engaged by resetting the channel one, channel two switches on the center pedestal. The ICAS interface um, provides indication to the crew on the ICAS primary screen by a moving pointer uh, and a digital readout in 0.2 degree increments of stab position and the pointer moves up and down a vertical scale with four hash marks spaced equally between the naught degrees, which is full nose down, and minus nine degrees, which is full nose up trim. Also, there's a green sector or a green band, which is where the pointer and the trim position needs to be for an acceptable takeoff. And if it falls outside of that area, um, <clears throat> the takeoff configuration alarm will sound when we are trying to take off. Two independent HSTA analog outputs are supplied to the DCUs for the generation of the stab position symbols. 
when neither of the pitch trim channels is engaged, it will use the channel one signal, even though it's not engaged. If it is not valid, it will use channel two. When a pitch trim channel is selected, the ICAST output, output comes from the position of the selected channel, uh, which is normally channel one, of course. If the primary signal is not valid, then the alternate position of the, of the channel uh, will, use, will be used. So here we can see a larger picture of the HSTA with the motor control unit mounted very close to it. Those um, two rods going off there that you can see, um, just to, as a pointer, they go into the um, um, pitch field simulator unit, uh, incidentally. Um, so the motor control unit receives signals from the HSTCU, and it's telling it which direction to move and how and what speed. And the MCU will control the speed and direction of the motor. And the MCU also converts the normal AC power that it's getting from the aircraft supply to DC power for the motor. Remember, it's a DC motor. The aircraft pitching moment, which is induced by the movement of the horizontal stab, is enhanced over the trim range by an accompanying deflection of the elevator surfaces. So when the stab moves, also the elevators will move. And this deflection, this elevator deflection, occurs because of the geometric relationship between the elevator PCU input linkage and the stab hinge axes. So as the horizontal stab moves, there will be a small input made to the elevator PCUs. This resultant motion causes small PCU inputs, which displace the elevators, which augments the force of the horizontal stab. The trim actuator, when it moves, moves at different speeds. Now, when you're manually hand flying the aircraft, the pitch trim outputs, outputs are made in high speed mode, which is half a degree per second, which is 100% of the maximum commanded speed. When the autopilot's engaged, the trim rate is in low speed mode, which is 0.1 degree per second, which is 20% of the maximum um, commanded speed. Um, however, when flap selection is made with the autopilot engaged, that will increase uh, to a high speed or 0.5 degree per second for the duration of the flap transition, because we've got to allow the stab to move quick enough to keep up with the flap position changes. MAC trim exists to counteract a slight notice down tendency of the aircraft caused by the airfoil center of pressure moving rearwards during high speed flight. It is the lowest form of trim, the lowest priority of trim, I should say, and only active when not overridden by an autopilot or manual trim input. It functions therefore only when the aircraft is being manually flown at high speed and trims at a rate of 0 0.03 degrees per second or 0 0.06 degree per second which is about six percent of the commanded or maximum commanded speed the there's a mitons diagnostic computer interface and the hstcu interface of the mdc via the dcu and transmits five ARING 429 labels, 270, 271, 272, 273, and 350. And these contain system operational status and fault information. Plus, of course, we've got our ICAST messages there, which you can see on the table. So we've got a config stab oral message with red warning message. Um, so that activates if the stab is not in the takeoff range with the aircraft weight on wheels and we uh, apply takeoff power. Um, there's a clacker that operates um, as an alert of a potential pitch trim runaway when the rate of the stab is more than 0.3 degrees a second for more than three seconds. Two uh, caution messages, stab trim and mac trim. So the stab trim tells us that both HSTCU channels are not engaged. The mac trim tells us that the mac trim function is not engaged or has failed. 
And then the white status message, channel one, channel two in op. <clears throat> You'll only see one of these at a time because if they both come on, then you would end up with a caution message, stab trim. Channel one in op, that means you've disabled channel one, but channel two is working fine. And channel two in op status message means you've disabled channel two, but channel one is okay. There is a ground maintenance uh, bit that um, tests the HSTA over its full travel in every operating mode and takes about three minutes to complete. It is a dynamic test that, uh, that will check out the following failures. So it's looking at the HSTCU functional cards, it's looking at the position sensors in the um, actuator, it's checking out the brakes and speed sensors in the actuator, and it's checking out the motors. To initiate the test, you need to delve into the avionics compartment and on the front panel of the HSTCU, there's a test switch along with uh, an indic LED indicator panel. And any failures will be indicated on the front panel of the HSTCU. And you can see the failures that are flagged up there. So speed error, signal error, direction error, brake malfunction, under or over travel, overheat or overcurrent.